An April wine. They've been Absolutely. hot for many a year, too. I it's enjoyed that concert. myself. We might add that the new album is Power Play, and they are seeing the new video here on MTV. Uh, this is a, a double bill, a double feature for you tonight of April Wine. It's always interesting to take a behind-the-scenes look at one of the members of the group, and we will do just that with Miles Goodwin coming up right now. Watch. <laughs> Profiles in Rock. I like to rock! I like to rock! This week's guest, April Wine and Miles Goodwin. I was thinking about rock and roll right now. And about having a good time and feeling good and putting that energy and receiving energy back. That's what I'm doing right now. I mean, there's no way I'm going to be a Mick Jagger. Uh, nobody could ever be a Mick Jagger again and Paul McCartney. I mean, I'm not going to go say that's what I want them to think of me. Stay tuned for the words and music of April Wine's Miles Goodwin next on Profiles in Rock. April Wine has arrived, but only after a long and dedicated decade climb to the top. With international success a reality, April Wine and Miles Goodwin talk with Doug Pringle. How did the name April Wine come about? I think they were sitting around a tavern one day and decided it would be a name that would really nailed them down to any style of music or anything like that. It was a name they just liked the sound of. I wasn't around at the time. That was the first April wine. Miles, maybe you can fill us in. Well, um, David was buying, as I remember, and he came up with the name. And uh, you can't argue with a guy that's buying. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the idea was that it didn't insinuate anything, which I really think worked to the uh, detriment of the group, because it's better to have a name that really sounds rock and roll. And, um, and they just, they, they liked the sound of it, didn't imply anything, they could do anything they want. At that point, we had four writers coming from totally different directions. And uh, we've tried to change the name uh, over the years, but, you, you know, it's, when you've got that foundation, it's, it's hard to, uh, to change, you know. Do you regret having the name? Would you have liked to have had oh, another yeah. name? Oh, any other name, probably, yeah. No, something that sounded heavy, like Led Zeppelin or uh, ACDC, something with, with a bit of, you know, Wumps to it, not April Wine. It doesn't even sound like a rock band, and I think that's a, a big problem with us overcoming uh, that rock and roll market. If we were called Bad Company or something like that, it'd be a lot easier, you know. After the great Canadian success that the band enjoyed for so long, without international success, do you think you weren't ready until now, or do you think you've been ready for quite a while? I thought we were ready a long time ago, but uh, I think you know, one of the big things was was First Glance, which is the album that really started it happening. Uh, that was the first album that really focused on the direction that April Wine has taken since then. It was no longer a, a band of, that, of many styles, it was a band that concentrated on rock and, and that turned it around for us. Why do you think it happened so quickly? Well, I guess we were a new, uh, we were a new group, which helped a lot, but we were seasoned, you know, so we had a lot of our stuff together. And although people thought we were new on the scene, we'd been around and so we had our thing pretty much worked out and we could contend with almost any situation from headlining to, uh, to being third on an act, whatever, with this much space on stage or the whole stage, we could handle it because of our 10 years up here before.
it's very exciting. I know work with a band with uh, three lead guitarists. And when they're all three playing together and they're all in the control room, you've got this incessant noise going on in the other room, which you never, ever get away from. So it gets pretty manic, and they're used to it. So they're talking to each other at the same time still playing, and I'm going, please, shut up. Mike, how does April Wine differ from other bands that you've worked with? Well, they're all drug-crazed hippies. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'd, in uh, in my career of doing this, I've tried, always tried to work with people that are easy to work with, you know, and, uh, without egos, uh, that generally just want to make good records, and uh, they're an amazing band. Live, they're phenomenal. <laughs> April Wine track came on the radio. Would a listener be able to tell it was April Wine? <clears throat> I think they probably could if they were familiar with April Wine in the first place. Because I have uh, a distinctive voice, for good or for bad. I do sound like. For good. For good, thank you. Give <laughs> 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 that man another picture. Buy that man a drink. No. Uh, I do, you know, and for a long time I didn't like the sound of my voice, and, uh, uh, but it is distinctive, you know, like for better or for worse, and I think that if they know April Wine, they recognize my voice, first of all, and we have a style of writing, I think, that is uh, recognizable, if you're familiar with the group. What makes April Wine special and different? I find it hard to uh, really put a finger on that, being on the inside, because we, we invariably never see ourselves the way other people do, apart from the writing. I think the live show has a lot to do with it. You know, a lot of groups are great recording groups, but they don't have a good live show, or vice versa can be true, and it doesn't always work for them there. Uh, when you got that balance, it's, uh, it works well, but in terms of actual characteristic, I really can't see specifically what it is. No, nope. it's a combination of things. We have an excellent lighting director who thinks of the uh, rise of system, the production on stage, uh, our sound man. Everybody is, uh, is working 100%. There's no weak links in the chain. We're not going uh, outrageous like with bombs and rockets and disasters on stage. But it's a kind of it's a very good combination that everything okay. working together. Well, I think one of the things is that, uh, especially with the American market, is that we. We are a band that has a lot of experience, but because everything is so new for us down there, we also have a lot of freshness. It's sort of like a, a marriage between those two things, which is not really common. A band that's been around a long time in America won't really have the freshness, but we were down there enthusiastic and, and putting out, but with a lot of experience, and I think it, uh, it definitely helped a lot. Seems that a rock and roll lifestyle is a complete opposite to a family lifestyle. What kind of problems does that cause, and how do you cope with it? Well, the thing is, you have to do both. I mean, this is what we do for a living, you know. So um, you obviously you handle it, or you get out one or the other. It's it, because you're never home. That's the thing about rock and roll, isn't it? I mean, you're always in the studio or on the road, and you really only have a couple of months out of the year to enjoy the family life and to sort of live a normal life, and like everybody else does, you know, routines and all that, which are great. How many more years would you like to do rock and roll? I can't imagine um, anything less than five or anything more than ten, you know. Uh, somewhere around there, I guess. But music forever and ever until nobody will, ever wants to hear from me again. You know, because I think I could slip into things other than rock and roll, you know. I think I could do ballads and, 
in other kinds of music, either as a producer or as a performer, and I want to perform as long as I can. But doing what I want to do and having people that want to hear what I do. Do you feel that music and politics mix? You can do some good. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, music is a, is a means, a vehicle to uh, to uh, to relate ideas and very positive thoughts. And you can only you can sing about the way things should be or the way you feel they should be. How much good it's going to do, I don't know. I mean, but there's no no harm in trying because you have an awful uh, lot of people out there that believe in what you say and what you do, and you can influence those people, I guess, to an extent. Do you feel a responsibility? Oh, definitely. I always have. I always have, and it's always been in the music. Um, with stuff like uh, I'd Rather Be Strong, and I mean, there's a whole gang of songs which I won't get into that say positive things and have positive thoughts. That's not, that's not the main thing with me. I sing about rock and roll right now and about having a good time and feeling good and putting out energy and receiving energy back. That's what I'm doing right now. And you don't want to preach to people. I've never wanted to preach. You have to do it in a way that doesn't insult people because nobody wants to be to be put upon that way, you know, everybody have their own, they have their own ideas and you can only suggest things, you know, and let people suss it out for themselves. If you weren't allowed to do music tomorrow, what would you do? Oh, geez, I don't know. I really don't know. There's nothing I'd rather do than music except paint, which I can't do, which is what I want to do someday is paint. Uh, maybe I'd try to start doing that. I don't know what I would do. Shovel driveways or something, get a paper route, I guess. Is that your secret ambition, to be a painter? Definitely study it. But I would also like to play the, learn to play the piano because I can only play what I write. I can't play anything else. I'd like to be able to sit down and entertain everybody here uh, and out there with a nice piano piece. You know, I think that would be great after supper to sit down with your family, your friends, and, and rip off uh, Mozart or something. You know. Time and time again. Off a bit, but if you were told you had a month to live, how would you spend that month? Oh boy. I think I would want to do an album. I would like to say something one more time before I left. It would probably be quite a different album for me. I don't know what it would, what it would probably be very sad, wouldn't it? Probably be pretty depressing. But on the other hand, I think there would be happy parts on it too. When some future rock historian places April Wine in the history of rock and roll. What would you like him to say about Miles Goodwin and April Wine? They were nice. They wrote, they did good music. I don't, I mean, there's no way I'm going to be a Mick Jagger or nobody could ever be a Mick Jagger again or Paul McCartney. I mean, I'm not going to go say that's what I want them to think of me, but just to be a good, solid musician, a good, solid person, making good, solid albums, and just to be respected and not to be uh, forgotten, you know.
Double Barrel Show for you, wasn't it? I hope you enjoyed it, because I did very much myself, because it was nice to get April Wine in concert. You know, we always give you concerts. Now one of the nice things, too, is to go in depth and see the people behind the music, like Miles Goodwin. So we try to do that whenever we can for you here on MTV, but you know you got concerts coming at you every week on MTV Music Television.